This is part three of the interview with Nasser Javeli that John recently did, a long three-hour interview that we just broke up into three parts. And for the final piece of the interview, John, anything people can look forward to coming up? Yeah, I think, um, you know, talking about, I know that there's some Javeli software stuff in it, as well as Square stuff, and uh, and I know that he was involved in some lawsuits uh, back in 1982, and I kind of talk about that a little bit. I think near the end, uh, and it's just uh, you know just interesting to to hear all the things that went on that you never hear about in magazines, and finally you get a chance to hear it straight from the master himself. One of the things I was really surprised by back in part one was him talking about Easy Draw and how that whole thing came about, and how he took it around and shopped it around, and then how he eventually it ended up at Sirius Software. I thought it was quite fascinating. Yep. Yeah, that's a really important origin story to get straight from him as well. And uh, Jerry Jewell was at uh, my Apple II reunion in 2015, and he said basically the same thing, same story. Um, I mistakenly thought that Nasser had co-founded Sirius Software with Jerry, but it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't Nasser. It was Terry Bradley who owned the computer land store that Jerry was the manager of. And those two created Sirius software and Nasser was their first outside contractor and started making games. So Nasser has been independent his whole life. He's never worked for a company as an employee ever. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is a good story to get straight. And I, probably just the last thing I wanted to mention is I had no idea uh, when NASA was talking about the Nintendo, that it had a floppy drive interface. Yeah, the um, the Japanese Famicom had a floppy disk system. And in 1987, when I was working at Origin Systems, they also had a Japanese Famicom, uh, or, yeah, the, the original Famicom system there. And it had the disk drive. And it was funny because the disks didn't look like normal three-and-a-half-inch disks that you see here, uh, you know, I guess <laughs> that you see 20 years ago. Um, they were like Fisher Price like toys. They were all carved up and everything. It looked really cool. <laughs> That's cool. Well, enjoy the third part of the interview, and thanks again, John, for for putting this together and letting us air it. Part three. Does do you have any? Are there any funny stories that you remember from your development? Serious ones, or Jabelli, or Square? Funny stories. <laughs> Or cool ones. <laughs> or like the best memories, you know, like the first time you got something up on the screen in high res or... No, not really. I can't think of any funny or cool memory. <laughs> uh, Going to Cattleman's. <laughs> no, nothing pops into my head right nope. now. What was, what was the most challenging thing in programming that you kind of remember hitting? Was it 3D? Well, I've never done really 3D. Those are all fake 3Ds. Yeah, yeah. They're not really 3D 3Ds. Uh, I always wanted to do 3Ds. Um, with actually, with iPhone and iPad, I was thinking about doing something in 3D. Because um, it just sounds interesting, but it's just as you get older, you don't have patience. <laughs> you just want to get things done quickly and yeah. you don't have time to read the manual or read the, you know, the Swift. You just try it. And, I mean, nowadays, if you really want to program, everything's on the internet. You can yeah. just Google things. Yeah, you could use Unity for 3D. <laughs> Unity is uh, not by Apple, right? They, no, no. You just use Unity and then it's who submits it? They submit it to Apple? Uh, no, nope. You do it yourself. It's basically, it's like Corona, where you just go get this tool called Unity, like you go get Corona, and you make something, and you submit it yourself to Apple, or you go through a publisher that then gets it all over the place. 
So how does that work? You basically convert it to Xcode? No, you actually Xcode has nothing to do with it. You basically use Unity, which has its own interface, and uh, and and you create three D three D models, and you can move them around in scenes and and pose everything in three D and save values and connect them to variables in your code and um, and and it does all the three D for you. So you just need to know how to move three D coordinates and stuff around, um, yeah. but. Yeah, you write your own code in C Sharp. It's a language called C Sharp. And uh, what we've been doing here is connecting Unity to Lua, which is what Corona SDK uses. So we can just program in Lua and not have to deal with the with C Sharp while we're making the game. So you can do you can use Corona to make 3Ds? Well, you can use Corona to do 2.5D like Doom. But we're using Unity and, and making it work with a language called Lua which Corona uses that same language. Lua is free. You can put it in anything. Right, right, right. Yeah, I know a little bit about Lua. I think I there was a talk about Lua years ago that I looked into, which is looks. I mean, makes a lot more sense than C to me. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah, it's like such a nice, easy language. Yeah, it's mini assembler of <laughs> basically. <laughs> it's about as it's about as simple as C gets. You know, it doesn't have a bunch of preprocessor directives and all kinds of garbage than stuff that C++ has. It's just you create a table, you use curly brackets, and that becomes a storage object, and then you just put variables in it as much as you want and then just pass that object to somewhere yeah. else. So it's really, really nice. And it dynamically can stick new things into an object. So you yeah. kind of create a class. It's not called a class. It's just called a table, and you just basically create create a table, throw as much stuff as you want in it, pass it somewhere else. That that other place in your code can shove more stuff in it if it wants to. It's, it's just really cool. It's really yeah, cool. I should language. look into that. I should look into that. Maybe if one you, of these days I'll get the urge to make a game and I can contact your kid. Then we can do it all. <laughs> all you have to do is come over here. We'll show you everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Just come over to Ireland. I'll show you how to do everything. There you go. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll do a project, me and him, the oldest and the youngest of <laughs> programmers getting together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, uh, that would be, be awesome if we can visit Ireland someday. What's the, what's the weather like? Raining all the time? It's, it's, uh, it's kind of misty most of the time. And uh, today was just sunny out all day long. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, a few days ago it was raining, which was really weird because the the, um, the winter time here was excellent. It wasn't raining. It was it's it's drizzly sometimes, but the the thing about uh, uh, Galway, especially about Ireland in general, is the weather changes every ten or fifteen minutes. So oh. sunny, raining, hail, sunny, you know, <laughs> all in a day. <laughs> so you always have an umbrella with you just in case. Actually, you have to wear a hoodie because umbrellas get torn apart. Really? Yeah, because the wind is crazy. So you have to wear a hoodie. I mean, there's dis discarded umbrellas all over the place because the tourists that come through here learn instantly that you don't use umbrellas. <laughs> so you get a really good hoodie. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just a couple of questions. When you, what was a typical day coding like for you? A typical day coding. A typical pizza night. And Bunch of Coke, Coca Cola, and coffee and smoking. Coding, nonstop. About how long? When would you start and when would you end? Usually, I would start probably around nine ten at night. Yeah. And it the longest probably I worked in. I do remember in Tokyo once. That I didn't leave the house for a day and a half, almost two days. And I'm pretty sure I was up for a good 40 hours, not even knowing it. Wow. Just eating pizza and drinking Coke. <laughs> Coke, so like. Get that thing finished and <laughs> leave for Hawaii. <laughs> leave for Hawaii? <laughs> was, this, was this Diet Coke or regular Coke? Uh, back then, there was no Diet Coke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, there was, that's right. There was, there was, there was, there was Coke. But I've, I've, I mean, my doctor insisted that I stop drinking Coke. So I, I 
started drinking Diet Coke like a long time ago. Yeah. But I was a cocaholic. I was uh, like, <laughs> drink Coke like oh, 20 packs a day. Wow. Mm. You know what I heard? You could say that this is true or not. Um, when you were coding space eggs, were you drinking coffee like crazy and smoking? Yes. Yes. I wasn't drinking coffee. I was just uh, drinking Coke and oh, okay. just had like coffee in the morning or something. And you used to smoke? Uh, uh, yes. I did that, did that occasionally, but it's whenever... Uh, I don't know if this was the stress or something that caused the smoking, but but then again, when I was when I went through the divorce, oh, yeah. I was an ugly divorce. That's when I quit smoking. Oh, wow. So I, it, I guess it works the other the other way around for me. If I'm not stressed, maybe I don't know. All, plus back then, everybody was smoking and it was hit. Oh yeah. Here's a question. You're smoking away. Do you know Larry Miller at, at Sirius? Larry Miller. He did Hadron and Epic. They were 3D games. No, I can't say I do. So, because that was must have been after me, after I left. It was like 83, I think. 80, probably 82, 83. But this, this is like the craziest programmer thing I've heard. This guy... He used to smoke a pipe, and he had a secretary that he would dictate the assembly language to, and she would write it shorthand on pads of paper, and he basically would just dictate his whole game, and he would go with her to Sirius with stacks of these these notepads, and he's sitting there talking to Jerry and, and Mark Tremel and you know Eric while she's typing the whole game in, and the game runs. Oh my god! Awesome. <laughs> Can you believe that? that? Awesome. <laughs> All on paper in his head. Yeah. In his head. I have questions. Yeah. Okay, Brenda's got another one. All right. So, if somebody, if if somebody described you, if how would they describe you as a coder? Do you think, and as a as a coworker, like somebody who is on your team, how would they describe you? Do you think? I don't know. I have to ask my coworker if I have any coworker. Uh, I'll say secret, would know. You secret of Mana. Takaguchi and everybody else. Secret of Mana was probably the one game that had other coders like that. You know, like more of a team on it. Yeah, yeah. Did, were I you mean, Lone Wolf? Were you like Lone Wolf of those guys? Pretty much. I, I'm not very good at teamwork. <laughs> <laughs> They're too slow, right? <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's not bad. It's just that, uh, yeah, I, like, uh, I live my, on my own schedule. Oh, you know, nighttime, yeah. I'm kind of moody, too. Like, it's like when you get the urge to do something, you do it, and it feels good. But other times, it's even though, like, even programming, other times, if even if they pay you a lot, you're just not in that mood. It's <laughs> You don't want to do it. No. <laughs> yeah, I so know. <laughs> that's why I'm not a team player. I can't work on schedule. Like, IBM was tough for me because uh, they had to have these games before they released PC Junior. Yeah. And I didn't like that because it's just put some kind of pressure on you that like you have to perform. Yeah. Like a certain day and you know, you don't, your hands are tight. And you're like, um, it's IBM. You know, you have yeah. to do it. It's IBM. You can't mess it up. Right, right. Well, I wasn't too worried about messing it up because they, they at, at a time, they were so hungry for somebody to program their thing and there weren't too many people around. Mm -hmm. I think it was between me and Bill. I think they talked to Bill, too, to do evaluation if he was interested. And he wasn't interested because he was... He's doing mouse uh, paint. He was doing some work for Apple. Yeah. At the same time, yeah, it was for Macintosh. Yeah. Uh, he wrote Mouse Paint. Right, right, right. But <laughs> if somebody were to describe me as a, a co-worker, would probably say, I don't know, impossible. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't work with them unless you wanted to stay up all night. What is the, well, you guys would be great together. <laughs> yeah. What is the, what's the favorite thing you've ever coded? 
I don't know if I have any favorite thing. The space um, eggs or, or Gorgon or? I don't know. I, I really can't tell. There's none of, none of the stuff that I've done is like made like lasting impression of that, that moment when I saw this or that. It was yeah. still pretty much all the same except in the beginning when I started programming that was uh, my most memorable time seeing learning how the graphic memory was mapped and right, right, <laughs> right, right. It was just figuring out that, you know, you put a bit in this memory location and light shows up <laughs> on your TV, which I had one of those big TVs hooked oh, up wow. to my Apple and I'm looking at it like <laughs> Wow. I can't believe it's I, I had a about twenty years ago I bought a TV which at the time was the biggest tube TV, I think it was 36 inch. That's huge. And it's sitting in a cabinet that I can't get it out. <laughs> <laughs> we finally got it out last week and we turned it down. And I remember when I bought that TV, I was so excited because it was so crisp and clear and oh, yeah, yeah. high definition <laughs> and all that stuff. And I look at it now and I go, oh my God, what was I thinking? Yeah, it's gross, yeah. <laughs> One of, you know, yeah. can I ask yeah. Yeah. one of the one of the questions, one of the things that I'm fascinated with is how game industries or even technology evolves in other countries. Um, particularly, you know, when you think about 1979 and during the revolution, what was the industry like back then? I mean, even technology for you when you were growing up. It sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Life pretty much sucked. Pretty really. really. Back then, geez, think about it. There was no cell phone. <laughs> there was no, I mean... No home computers, really. There was no computers. I mean, uh, TV, I grew up when I was little. I remember black and white TV. Uh, color TV, I didn't see color TV till I was um, probably six or seven, I'd say. I remember... Before we got our color TV, I, as a kid, I don't remember, probably six years old, I tried to paint the antenna so we can get color on our TV. <laughs> oh, that's so great. <laughs> that's and hilarious. Got in trouble for it. And another time, I bet. when we got the color TV, nobody was home. I opened the back of it, trying to figure out Whoa. what's in it that makes color. And all I saw, these big tubes. Oh, no. Little TVs, they have tubes. The vacuum, yeah. And the vacuum tubes. And I would pull one at a time out and look at the picture to see what happens, <laughs> trying to figure out what works what doesn't work. You're so lucky and you didn't get hit. I took a few of them <laughs> out, and it was on the floor, trying to like, be careful to know which one goes where. And the phone rang, and I jumped, and... Messed them all up. I didn't know which one oh, was no. right. And I was so paranoid. <laughs> Tried to put them back together, but I didn't know if it's going to blow up or not. So I just left it there and ran. And I was going to like run away from house. <laughs> <laughs> and then started walking so and walking and crying. <laughs> and about, when, when about, about, I don't know, about a mile or a couple of miles from yeah. my house. And I was still crying, and I remember sitting there and said, I can't go back home now because I'm going to be in so much trouble and they're going to kill me. <laughs> and so, and so. But anyhow, they found me like a couple hours later. They were looking for me. They came home and they knew what was going on. And I didn't get punished for it just because they didn't want to punish me anymore. They thought I had enough. <laughs> that was enough punishment. <laughs> and he found out that you could put them in in any order and just it would work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, all I wanted to do is just figure out why it works and how it works. It's, it's just curious. That's pretty cool. Uh, the antenna thing, it, it was a disaster because the uh, can of paint that I got from one of my neighbor's house, the uh, Israeli guy, I remember, <laughs> his, his, they were doing some painting in their house, and I got the whole can of paint and tried to get on the roof and <laughs> paint the antenna for it, hoping oh. that we get a color picture. It's a roof-mounted antenna. Whoa! Yeah, yeah. This is like we talking about the old days when there was a like roof-mounted antenna. There was no cable going around. Yeah, it's a UHF VHF, right? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> wow, that's pretty funny. That's a good one. I've never heard 
any story like that before. <laughs> <laughs> no one is crazy enough to call it the antenna. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> yeah, there was, uh, I mean, when you look at it today, it was uh, occasionally I drive my nieces or not their friends to school, or used to, and the whole bunch of them in my car, and nobody's talking. And I say, why are you so quiet? And they're all talking about texting. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> in the car. I said, like, jeez. <laughs> You could just open your mouth. I know. <laughs> I know. I you know. It's so funny. Whole new generation is life has gotten so much easier, and it's it's got a good side of it, it's bad side of it, and people are not spending enough time with themselves or nature. It's just <laughs> everything is virtual. I prefer yep. virtual. Um, yeah, the high definition TVs are great for visiting places that you've never been and see it in high definition, but being there, it's just totally different things. Yep, yep. Uh, the I think next adventure is going to uh, Indonesia for three months. Um, Indonesia and Thailand There's a place or suburb called Kimala. Yep. In, um, I think it's Thailand or Taiwan, Thailand. That one of our friends, um, he knows the owners or somebody that he can hook us up for a whole month. Wow. Living that place, right? So you're going to go just check out the nature. So really, really appreciate the computers when I come back here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's pretty it's fun cool. To occasionally go places when there is no computer, no TV, no electricity, or nothing. Then you pull out your phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, if the computers and phone are great, but it's just distracting. Yeah. Like if I, if I do programming now, um, I don't know, I get, distra get distracted all the time. <laughs> yep. There's no way that I could sit for 12 hours and code without getting distracted by phone. Or oh, you're right. Or, you know, That's right. Because you're online. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so funny back in the days of the Apple II when there was no such thing as distraction like that, and you could just code forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could just sit and get lost in Apple. Yep. <laughs> I truly get lost in there and, you know, start coding. You code that you start coding when, when you were, like, 11, 12? Yeah, when I was 11, but really, when I... When I um, started learning 6502, you wouldn't believe this. I I got Roger Wagner's book in at Christmas of 1982, which was Assembly Lines, which was published in Soft Talk Magazine as a series of monthly columns, and he put it together and published a book. And that book was, I basically, from the second or third page, knew how to code an assembly because it was so well written and so easy to understand. And I was just blown away. So I learned, I, I immediately wrote a little bitty program to put a high res dot or a low res dot on screen. So I just JSR F800 to turn on, you know, GR, mm -hmm. you know, graphics mode and set the color, put a dot at zero, zero, and then RTS. And, and it worked. And I couldn't believe how easy it was and that it, that it, that it worked. And now I'm like, the whole world is open now. But what ha what was happening was this is Christmas, so we're just like you know a week from the New Year. We were moving to England a week later to basically move to move to Europe to England, and Apple and everything was going to be packed away for half a year. Oh my god! And I just learned assembly language. So so what happened is I get to England and I am now hand assembling code on paper. So I had to write all my code on paper, draw my pictures, bitmap, change it to hex, right, all on paper. Right. And, and and this is so at lunchtime, the they had Apple IIs at that school. And at lunchtime, I could type as, that hex as fast as I could to get it into the Apple and see if it worked. You know, right, and right. basically see, a piece. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. That's, that's a lot more interesting than what I did. Oh, I don't know. Find figuring out how uh, assembly language works from nothing is oh, yeah. pretty crazy. <laughs> well, if you have if you have nothing else to do, there was no iMessage, there was no thing. Yep, yep. You keep yourself busy and you figure things out. I mean, if you had any anybody else in my place 
probably would have done the same thing. <laughs> I would have found it no, a lot sooner than me. Yeah, it wasn't that. as fast as I, people think I was, but uh, it's just out of boredom. There's nothing else to do. <laughs> Were you trying? Were you? Which were you back right, then? Out of boredom. Out of boredom. He decided to learn assembly. Yeah. <laughs> so so but it was exciting. Straight. Yeah. <laughs> but you were also yeah, exciting. What, what, what was exciting about it is um, instant gratification. Yeah. Like you do something, and right away you see the result. Yeah. You don't have to wait for it. That was probably the best. The reason I got into it. Yeah. And it's it's just. And you know what's cool? This Corona SDK that I'm talking about is like the Apple II again. It is instant gratification. It's instantly up on the screen. So yeah. if you, yeah. <laughs> but, 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 yeah, so <laughs> were you trying to beat anybody else back then? Like, Broderbund was coming out with these games, you know, and, and Jerry's like, what? You know, they got these games out that are better than his games or whatever, and you're like, now you're like, oh, competition time. No, I wasn't so much, except that one time that Jay was kind of upset because I thought he was going to lose money uh, on that game that we just put up and we had a competition. But what, what was the game, that, what was the Broderbund game that came out? I don't remember what it was. I don't know, no, no, it wasn't, I don't think it was Broderbund. Maybe it was Sierra. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, because they did a, a arcade games at that time. Right, right, right. Um, Cannonball yeah. Blitz. I don't remember the name of that game, but I know it was better than ours. That's, <laughs> that's I think it was Program uh, by a Russian or Japanese. It wasn't. Oh, was it was it uh, uh, Puck Man by June Wada? It was. Uh, you have to turn the monitor sideways. No. No snoggle jawbreaker? There was a game that you had to turn the monitor sideways? Yeah, yeah, because if you remember in the arcades, the mon the, the screens right, were right. vertical. That's basically a regular CRT turned sideways. And so uh, a programmer named June Wada programmed a total ripoff of, of Pac-Man called Puck-Man, and, and Broderbund published that in 1980 or, or 81. And he had to, did they get in trouble for it? <laughs> uh, yeah, they did. And, and then they made Jawbreaker, which then they got sued again by Atari. Um, or was it Midway? Because it was a it was a Pac Man clone. And, yeah. And uh, yeah. So uh, do you remember Olaf flew back? That name? Yes, I do remember that. Olaf didn't he do Olaf? He did Red Alert. Was, he did what Red Alert. Uh, Lubeck, L-U-B-E-C-K. Lubeck. No, maybe not. I'm thinking of Olaf, Olaf Gustafsson or somebody oh, that used to work at uh, Sirius and did some work for me. Oh. How about Alan Merrill? No. He was, a, he was at Sirius maybe after you. Um, you know, when, I, when I left Sirius, uh, the only programmers... Eric? Eric was just starting. He was doing cops and robbers. Yes, he was doing. He was just starting, and when we left, then he brought his game to to, to me because yes, because his father was working there, and probably because he get a better deal than Sirius. <laughs> Sirius now they're getting enough and more programmers. That's and right. And getting more famous. No, they weren't offering the same thing that they used to offer. Yep. When I started, it was basically, the first game was 50-50. Um, you market it, you get 50%. I write it, I get 50%. Nice. That, over time, things changed. Now programmers, uh, I mean, the new programmers, they don't get much. Yep. I mean, even a percentage, if they get... Um, Half a percent. That's like normal. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was, he, uh, I guess Orbitron was the game <clears throat> that he had done as well. It was a pretty good game, Orbitron. Orbitron, I do remember some Orbitron. It was kind of like a reverse Star Castle. You were in the center shooting out. <clears throat> and then Rusky Duck, which he brought. 
right? Who brought? I think Eric brought Rusky Duck over to Jabelli. Yes, yes. Because at the time that we were doing game, it was Apple and Atari. We had two programmers that they were doing Atari games for us, and Eric and me were doing Apples. Yeah. And at that time, I slowed down a bit. Um, <sighs> Again, I was just being selfish and spending more time, you know, playing and doing games, as I figured, you know, you got plenty of programmers that can do in the same business. But um, is this is this uh, was this around the time with that whole Anthony Freiberger situation? Oh yeah, yes, Anthony Freiberger. He Phil knew his mom. Um, there was a rumor that they were having an affair. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> so he brought him in, you know, to work for us to to basically do. He was first. He was supposed to do like packaging and stuff like that. But he wanted to learn things like that. And he worked there for a good five, six months. He would occasionally come to me, my office, and ask questions and stuff like that. And he showed me like some drawing that he's designed for a new game and stuff like that. And right when I did the IBM games, he claimed that I stole his idea. And even though there was no code, it was just an idea that he had for <laughs> an easy game. Yeah. Most of it was basically saying like, okay, if, like J for going up was his idea. Oh, his butt for going down is this. That's idea. amazing. Like, <laughs> things that you really can't copyright. Yep. But because he he had a lawyer, one of those um, contingency lawyers, that he had he told them because it's IBM. We just sue. Oh, and yeah. They're settled. It's never going to go to court or anything like that. Interesting. You don't have to worry about that. Usually, big companies, they don't want problem. So, they were, his lawyer was hoping that, you know, IBM would come and say, here's $20,000, go away. Yeah. The problem was IBM is they don't play that game because if one, one person sues them and wins, then yep. there's going to be a whole lot of other people. So, they, the court actually was in Sacramento. Wow. And they sent their lawyers, I had my lawyers, and didn't even get to do anything. Just when the first thing the judge was asking about uh, uh, the similarity that's got to be <laughs> enough uh, to even consider that this was a copy to begin with. Yeah, there's no way to do that. Right. And IBM lawyers, of course, they are a lot better. I mean, more resources. They brought in like 20 other games. <laughs> that they all have the same things in them. Yeah. And if you push up the door, it's going to go this way. Rotate this way. It can't be your idea. It's, exactly. A tire yeah. is nobody's idea. You can't say, I design mean, my game has a tire and nobody else can have a tire. Exactly. They, they brought prior art like crazy to the, to the table, which just demolished right. all the arguments. So that was, uh, yeah, that was my adventure with, uh, <laughs> with that kid. <laughs> yep. and, and he had, I, I felt really bad for him, actually. He had some, some, some kind of disease that he wasn't supposed to live for more than a couple of years or something like that. So wow. that's basically why he gave him the job. I see he was just a young kid and Give him a wanted chance. to learn about computers and stuff like that. And, and he had designed, while he was, you know, was sitting and doing nothing, he would go on the computer and, you know, make some stuff where there is like a little characters and stuff like that. And 
while you work at a place and design something, it's not yours. It's the company's yeah. <laughs> product. He's getting paid for it. Uh, but his idea was, even though nothing from him was ever used, but his idea was that he had spent time with me and had given me ideas. Yeah. And I've used those ideas to create my games. Yeah, uh, Mouser. And therefore, it's his idea, and he should be compensated for it. And I don't mm. know. I just, I didn't. At first, I didn't want to get involved. Just want to you know, give him some money and go away. Yeah, because I just felt bad for him. Because <laughs> all the story I heard from Phil that he's got some kind of a cancer or he's under treatment and all that stuff, and it's not. He's only had a couple of years to live and all that stuff, but. Then it got to the point that uh, uh, it was just ridiculous. Yeah, and, and IBM yeah. wasn't IBM couldn't allow that to happen anyway because then everyone would jump on that. Right, right. <laughs> and IBM didn't want. Uh, I mean, he came in. The lawyers came in just one day. Probably cost IBM hundred thousand dollars for for that lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow. He had like, talked for like. I don't know, maybe five, six minutes to prove that, you know, that they have no case. Wow. And at a time, his lawyer uh, had dropped the case, and then he had gone to San Francisco and got another lawyer <laughs> and had told him that he actually has proof that he made the game and showed me his code, and I've actually stole his code to wow. create the game, which is a totally different machine, Apple and Atari. <laughs> and his game, and actually after the game was for IBM was released, he had uh, hired somebody or talked to Broderbond about publishing a game for him. And I guess they didn't think his idea or his game was interesting enough and didn't take it, so he was suing me for that, too. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> but, uh, because I sold his idea, and it was already on IBM, Brother One didn't think it was, <laughs> has any sales value for his version. Unbelievable. Because there's already another version out there or something like that. It's just gone crazy. It's and snowball, yeah. Not that lawyers, but... Yeah, that's the system here. So thanks for listening to that amazing interview with Nasser Jabelli. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention after the interview was that uh, since Nasser doesn't really interact with people in the game industry at all, and he has all this cool stuff that he used to create games back then, he still has it. And I talked him into giving me his original Apple II Plus that he wrote the games on wow. uh, back then. And he gave me the, the NES hardware that he used to develop Final Fantasy. And he gave me the Super Nintendo development machine he used to write Secret of Mana. Wow. So I have, I have all of his hardware that he used to develop. That is so awesome. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's here in Ireland with me, but it's uh, some of it's going to be going to museums soon. Oh, that's excellent. I think it's going to be the Strong Museum in Rochester, New York. Oh, okay. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it was just awesome getting getting his stuff. He, he sent me a bunch of other things, too. So those are really great Apple II items, like master discs for games and stuff. Mm. Well, that's excellent. Yeah. Very so, awesome. yeah, it was, it was, it was awesome. And, and I hope someday to, to maybe do a little bit more uh, talking to Nasser. In fact, um, all of the stuff that I got was, you know, he sent it to Ireland, and I didn't want it to be too big of a hassle for him to get it to me. So Tom Hall, my co-founder friend uh, at Software, Ion Storm, and Monkey Stone Games, he went from San Francisco to Sacramento to Nasser's house and met him there to pick up all this stuff from his house okay. and got to talk to him for a while. Yeah, and then Tom came back and he shipped it all to me. <laughs> awesome. 
<laughs> yeah, super cool. Very so, cool. Uh, hope everybody, everybody had fun hearing Nasser's stories about how he did stuff. Absolutely, it was really amazing. And thanks very much for for letting us take a listen.